We have another installment of our First Ladies Man. This is a segment that we're going to be doing here on the show each day this week. And we were excited to feature Andy Oak yesterday. He's an award-winning TV producer and author. Even my mom called me after our segment yesterday, Andy, and said, I'm buying his books. That's great. (laughs) So, Andy Oak, uh, the First Ladies Man, welcome back to KFGO Radio. It's great to be back with you guys today. Speaking of incredible influence, and that's maybe how we tried to sag into you here, uh, you have two ladies that you want to talk about, two first ladies that you want to talk about today who had some incredible influence for their time. The first one is from your volume one, and that would be Abigail Adams. J.J. Gordon even sporting some Abigail Adams trivia before we got in the air. I'll let let him uh, throw some at you. I'm glad Abby well, made the list today, Andy, because not only is she a first lady, but she's the first lady to raise a future president as well. Am I correct in that fact? That is that is absolutely correct. John Quincy Adams did so much work in Monroe administrations and other administrations that when he ran for office himself, he also, now here's a great fact about John Quincy Adams, he was married to, before the Trump administration, the first and only foreign-born first lady. Louisa Catherine Adams was born in uh, in London in 1775, and her father has ties to Maryland. He was a colonist, an importer, exporter, and Louisa Catherine Adams' uncle was the first governor of Maryland, but she had never stepped foot into the United States until John Quincy Adams brought her back after they were married. And now, of course, Melania Trump, the, the second foreign-born first lady. Wow, only two in the history of our country. Well, there's only the, Melania Trump is also the second only Catholic first lady. Uh, she she does associate and affiliate herself with the Catholic Church, though not openly practicing. I don't think with 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 tremendous regularity. The Trumps do go to church, but but she's not devout. I, I guess not being Catholic myself, I don't know all the correct terminology. But Jacqueline Kennedy was the first and only um, uh, Catholic first lady before Melania, but Melania and her staff ha- have confirmed she, she was born and raised Catholic. So let's talk about Abigail Adams. Sure. Well, you know, we talked yesterday about, about these ladies coming out of the pages of history books and, and off of the oil paintings. And I think the further back we go, this is more difficult to do, obviously, because none of us were alive during the Adams administration. But when I went to Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, they have 70,000 pages of Adams Family correspondence. And I'm sure all the listeners and you guys there, you know, we picture Abigail Adams from her White House portrait with a bonnet and an older lady. But the earliest letter they have at the Massachusetts Historical Society between John Adams and Abigail Adams is from October 17, 1772. And it's when they were first dating. And John Adams addresses the letter to Miss Adorable. That was his little pet cute nickname for his girlfriend, Abigail Adams. Wow. And this is such a far stretch from anything that we're taught in history or anything that we know openly about these ladies. He goes on to say, I'd like to come over after the hour of 9 o'clock and steal as many kisses as I can. I mean, you put these two together in their White House portraits, and you don't picture, you know, younger people like wanting to sneak over to each other's houses and make out with their parents in bed, you know, like everyone else did in America and beyond. I mean, these are real people. And, and to, to see these letters and get this kind of access to someone who then would become, I, I've mentioned, uh, Amy, off the air to, to you, that, that Abigail Adams would, would be a progressive thinker today. What she thought about race, religions, race relations, religion, and, and civil rights and gender equality hundreds of years before women could vote, is, is progressive in today's thinking. She was a truly remarkable woman. Can you give an example? Well, sure. When John Adams was running for president, uh, he asked advice of his wife. He wrote her a letter saying, what should I do? Washington isn't running for president. And this is counterintuitive to, to anything that, that I thought or knew of, of uh 18th century uh, women at the time giving their husbands political advice and, 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 and career advice. And, and Abigail Adams wrote back, she said, if you want to run for president, you know, figure that out on your own. Uh, pray about it. Think about, you know, flowery word language of the day. But she said very clearly, 
she said, I will serve under no man other than George Washington. So she was telling her husband in the 1700s, the late 1700s, come home first lady, or come home president, or, or just come home. She would not have him be vice president again, and, and he took her advice, ran for president, and won. But, but while he was running for president, before he even won the election, she said very famously, a lot of people will remember her letter uh, that says, remember the lady. But I've held that letter. I've seen that letter in person. And beyond that line that we quote so often and so famously, she said, remember the ladies, for when you have them in your favor, the men will be on your side. Before she could vote, she knew that if a man came home and said he was voting for John Adams and his wife said, you're an idiot if you're voting for John Adams, the guy wasn't going to vote for John Adams. But if you walk in the door 17-whatever as, as a man of the House and say, I'm voting for John Adams, and your wife says, well, you're a smart man for voting for John Adams. You think to yourself, I am a smart man because my wife told me so. I mean, she <laughs> knew back then who was calling the shots. One of my favorite uh, miniseries of all times is John Adams from HBO, and Laura Linney plays Abigail Adams. I thought she did a phenomenal job. I was most intrigued at the time when he was just a lawyer, and he would come home and discuss his cases with her uh, in their bedchambers, and they portrayed her as a very strong, very savvy woman, so it doesn't surprise me that she had that political knowledge early on. Of course. And I mean, like you say, the, the, the Massachusetts Histor- Historical Society has 70,000 pages of Adams family correspondence over four generations. The letters go on and on and on. And we see this with her writing to uh, a schoolmaster who wanted to kick a, a, an African-American boy out of class in Massachusetts. And she said things back then like, do we not pray with him in church? Do we not work together in our homes? Why can he not study? with our children as well. This is not a Christian way of looking at things. I mean, they were Quakers. They didn't own slaves. But this is this is a hundred years before the the Civil War she knew it was wrong. A a truly, truly remarkable woman. That sort of gives me chills to think about. Yeah, it does. Was this one of the most, was this one of the easiest first ladies to study because of all of the correspondence that they have? I would imagine the more historic you get in the first ladies, the harder they are to study. Well, that, that's that's a great point, Amy. And 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 people like Abigail Adams, Mary Lincoln, Eleanor Roosevelt, Jacqueline Kennedy, Martha Washington—the ones that we think we know or that we actually do know the most about—ended up to be the hardest for me to study, but also even more difficult to write about, because what I wanted to do was find out things we didn't know. So there's all this research and all this information and all these movies and documentaries and things about these women. My gauge for the success, excuse me, of a show on someone like Abigail Adams was after the the live guests on the C-SPAN show and after all the call-ins and all the experts and all the research and all the stuff that I did, if something still popped out of the show that I didn't know or hadn't heard or come across, I thought, this is a successful show. Everyone's learning something here, and it happened every show. So you would think some of these ladies were were easier to study than others, but you come up with someone like Eliza Johnson, and pretty much anything you're telling people about Eliza Johnson is (laughs) brand new information, (laughs) including her name is Eliza Johnson. You you know what I mean? (laughs) Yes. You you know, (laughs) I think one of the most important things you've you've said here, and it's fascinating. Man, I love listening to you. Uh, and I, I'll look forward to reading you too, is that we often whitewash the way people behaved back in the olden days by saying, well, you have to put it in perspective of the times. Yeah. You know, but as a matter of fact, there were people that knew that you shouldn't be killing Native Americans on the prairie, knew that you should not be denying education to a black person, as you just said. You know, so that perspective of the times doesn't wash with me, so... Thank you for saying that. Uh, Jack, that, that's, that's an excellent point, too. And, and, and to, to kind of piggyback on that, you also have to, you, you do have to take the time and the language and the, the thought and the social norms into consideration to a certain extent while realizing the, there are these people, these forward-thinking people that knew stuff was right, wrong, or, or otherwise. But, you know, we, we hear a lot about Mary Lincoln being, having this horrible childhood and losing her parents and, and or losing her, her mother at a very early age and having an evil stepmother and, and on and on and on. 
and we get that from her early diaries and journals. But consider this. I know a lot of teenage girls and teenage boys that didn't get along with their parents, didn't get along with their step-parents, and what some teenage person writes in their journals might have to be taken with a grain of salt, because when I was in Lexington, Kentucky, where Mary Todd was raised, I found quite the opposite. She had a fantastic childhood. She was a privilege to, to information and conversations and situations that most men were not privy to, let alone young girls. Her education was by far and above superior to most human beings, most Americans of the day in private schools. She had a pony that she rode to school. She had a house full of brothers and stepsisters and stepbrothers and, and two maternal, two, two uh, uh, grandmothers that were widows and, and had uh, wildly successful estates. And the role models she had were, were remarkable. So it's a, it's a great point to, to notice people like Abigail Adams, but you do have to then consider what type of language, what are the times and what are the social norms, and it makes modernizing these women or their perspectives difficult. Okay, let's talk, before we let you go, because we have to wrap up here in a few minutes, sure. Helen Taft, a first lady that probably a lot of people couldn't name, you say is actually a first lady with a lot of first lady firsts. That's a lot of firsts in one <laughs> sentence. She is, yeah. And and uh, uh, autocorrect, always wanted to fix that when I'm writing my book. You can't say first, first lady first. and, all, and But but <laughs> Helen Taft, how, how, what, what do you guys think of when you think of first ladies? If, you, if you've been to Washington, D.C., or been to the Smithsonian or anything, there's an image, there's an article, there's an item that comes into mind when you think of first ladies. What is it? Oh, all uh, first ladies? Mary Tyler yeah. Moore. Oh, no. Uh, I'm... <laughs> like all first ladies in general or Helen? Well, sure. In the, in the interest of time, the, the number one answer in rooms across America and everyone are the gowns, the dresses. Everyone thinks of dresses when they oh. think of first ladies. Oh, right. I thought because you were talking the... about Helen Taft and I was like, nothing comes to my mind. No, 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 okay. no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That was kind of a loaded oh, loaded question, but, but it, it's the dress. People think of a lot of things when they think of first ladies, but typically the first thing you think of are these gowns because of the the uh, mm-hmm. uh, the, the exhibit at the first lady, at the uh, Smithsonian on first ladies. Well, Helen Taft is the first first lady to donate her gown to the first first lady exhibit in 1912. Two women were putting together the exhibit. Helen Taft was the sitting first lady, and they asked her for an article, asked her for something for the display. So she gave her them, the two women, her 1909 inauguration gown, and since then, and then retroactively, we've gone back to get a dress for every first lady, whether inaugural gown or not, as they all did not have inaugural gowns for various reasons over the years. But the image that we think of when we think of first ladies was because of Helen Taft, and she could have given anything. She could have given earrings, a pair of shoes, a chair, a table, a picture, a painting, jewelry, but she gave that dress. And since then, it has become the thing we think of. She's also the first first, she, well, she planted the first cherry blossom tree in Washington, D.C. And I'm telling you, I had a decent education growing up in Montgomery County, college education. And, and I did not know that in the nation's capital, one of the main symbols, what people come from around the world to the Cherry Blossom Festival, I did not know Helen Taft planted the first one. The influence these women have in some of the policies and some of the physical structures they've built or planted or, or the institutions they, they've established are in modern times, but we don't even know these women's names. But that's how influential they are throughout the years in our country and thus the modern world. Well, boy, thank you a great deal. And we get to do this again tomorrow, okay? Absolutely, absolutely. I got a couple good ones. I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth, but... We'll do this all week. We'll do a volume one lady from from the past, and we'll do a, a volume two lady from a, from our from our more modern recollection, and and we'll roll through and, and have some fun and, and and learn something in the in, in the, at the same time. Andy Oak is the first ladies man. If you missed a minute of this, you can go back and listen again this afternoon. It'll be posted on kfgo.com under the podcast section. And uh, a link to his website and more information about him will be there as well. Thanks, Andy. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Talk to you tomorrow, guys. Have a great day. You too.